My name is Andy Sokolovich. I'm the Vice President of Economic Development for the Clinton Regional Development Corporation, and thank you for joining us uh, for the September edition of the Clinton Business Roundtable. This is an exciting one because there's a lot going on. Uh, school recently started. We have a lot of programming that's new. We have a lot of things happening both in the K through 12s as well as the community college. So we thought it appropriate to bring in the superintendents uh, from Clinton, River Bend, and we had Comanche lined up, but unfortunately Tom Parker had something that he needed to address. But we also have Brian Kelly with us, the president of Clinton Community College. So what we're gonna do here is kind of go around the horn for the three of them, allow them about uh, two to three minutes to provide us with a quick little update as to what's going on within their districts. Um, then out of that will come questions if you have questions for the group, uh, please either type it in the chat or just feel free to unmute yourself. We keep this thing very conversational and laid back just as we would if we were in person. Uh, so again, questions if you have, you can hit the little raise your hand button. You can type it in the chat or simply unmute yourself. I will ask you to uh, keep yourself muted if you're not asking a question. That way we reduce any kind of feedback when our presenters are speaking. So thank you so much, fellas, for being on. We're gonna go ahead and start with Daryl Hogue, our partner across the river at River Bend School in Fulton, Illinois. Daryl, what's going on within your district? Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, of course, thanks for having me. Um, I always appreciate having uh, the opportunity to talk to the employers, um, my partners in education across the river. So, um, and I, I will say we get to communicate a lot. So uh, we really get to sort of move these programs forward. So for River Bend, we've, we continue to um, offer a work study program for our seniors. That is something that we look for employers to host our seniors 60 to 80 minutes a day. We have a block schedule so they can spend a good chunk of time with, with employers. And um, we're always looking for more employers to place students in. I can tell you work study programming is successful and meaningful for the students. Um, we know through a study recently of a three year period that students in work study programs have a GPA, a grade point higher, they attend school more frequently, they miss fewer days, and they are twice as likely to attend a two or four year uh, program. On top of the community involvement work study program, we've been working closely with both Illinois Sauk Valley Community College and Eastern Iowa Community College in trying to get apprenticeships off the ground. Uh, we have students who are crossing the the Great Divide, the Mississippi River, and attending and um, part of the welding apprenticeship program. Um, thanks to really the folks in Iowa for making that happen for Illinois. They went to bat for us, and it's a it's a great program that our kids are allowed to participate in. Um, on the other hand, on this side of the river, we are working with SOC to launch a multi-craft, so that's electronics, um, machining, um, construction, uh, welding, multi, multiple crafts within one um, training uh, program. That's something we offer at the White City Area Career Center now, and we are hoping to grow it so it becomes an apprenticeship type opportunity. So again, if businesses are interested in that, we would love to partner and I really think employers can capture these students if they can tie in wages in some way, shape, or form. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, Gary, your two-minute hit list. What's going on in Clinton? I know there's a lot. <laughs> uh, I, I would start off with probably a broader uh, conversation in our district called Portrait of a Graduate, and uh, we're beginning really getting into that process of in earnest to say, what should a Clinton High School graduate be able to demonstrate skill-wise uh, when they cross the stage as a graduate? So uh, we really do need to have strong community input into, the, into that portrait. And uh, so if there is interest out there and you want to be part of that process, please reach out to our school district. We would still like to get a few more community members involved in that process. Uh, I think that the next major thing we're working on is uh, planning for the new career and technical regional center that'll open in Clinton. And I'm sure Brian will talk a little bit about this, hopefully uh, next fall. 
but there's a lot of work to be done between now and then in terms of uh, we're looking at, I believe, eight career pathways at the Clinton site. Uh, what does the programming for prerequisites look like in grades seven through 10? So when they hit those capstone courses at the regional center, uh, we'll also have to have some discussion on staffing. We're these areas normally are major shortage areas in terms of staffing. So I think between the districts and the community college, we have to have some earnest conversations to say, how is that going to staff and look like uh, next fall when that opens up? Uh, one new program at Clinton High School this year is called the Building Operator, uh, Bil Building Operator Program. And uh, what it is, we have five juniors that are actually involved with Southwestern Community College in uh, Energy Association of Iowa Schools, and they're learning basically how to operate and maintain systems within a building. So your HVAC, your plumbing, your electrical, lighting, all down the line, any of those sy sy systems. Uh, at the end, it's a two year program. So at the end of next year, when they graduate, these student five students, if they successfully complete it, will be credentialed in this program. So that's a brand new one as well. And we are continuing with the welding apprenticeship, which Daryl mentioned earlier. Thank you, Gary. So Brian, a lot of pressure on community colleges when we talk about workforce development. Uh, you guys are the step post-secondary after somebody graduates high school, but you have a lot of things going on. And also kudos to you and your team for passing a massive bond referendum uh, to support career and technical education. So Brian, what's your hit list look like? Yeah, thank you. And and nice to be on with, uh, with uh, the superintendents this morning who are a huge part of this. You know, when we talk about the passage of the bond, a lot of credit goes to the school boards and our eight districts in Clinton and Jackson County. Our superintendents, we really worked at the local level. You know, I'm, I'm so pleased that all eight of the school districts in Clinton and Jackson County were able to, um, to, to, to move forward and approve students, over 250 students for the next decade. Um, it's absolutely incredible and it's the work. We, we talk a lot and we've got a lot of work to do. You know, Gary talks about, you know, some of the unknowns in terms of, you know, curriculum paths for our younger students. And I look at this as a workforce answer that is not only in the immediate term, but this is a generation worth of work, right? As we install these career academies in Clinton and DeWitt and Maquoketa, what we're really looking for is a generation worth of supplying trained workers to the workforce. And why is this so important? You know, something I don't want folks to forget. Um, Economies are cyclical. And um, at the end of the Great Recession in 2008, four out of five jobs lost were lost by individuals who had no formal training beyond high school, right? 80% of those jobs lost in the recession were for individuals who didn't have training beyond high school. And although our scenario now might look very, very uh, good in terms of employment, we know that cycle will change. And I wanna make sure that the, the, the residents of our communities and, and our region in Eastern Iowa have a skill set that kind of ensure them that even in the tough times, their job skills are going to be applicable and they'll be employable. Um, working really closely right now with the principals on those paths and the counselors directly in the high school, our deans are working with uh, developing them. We've had a great month of work. We've got some really good pathways that we'll share with the superintendents next week. Um, really clear visual plans of what you would take in high school and what you would take in, uh, in college to complete that degree. Um, what's important is, um, March 2020 uh, or March 21 passage of that bond opening in April or August of, of 22, that's 18 months, right? So without a time machine, we really couldn't have, we couldn't have gotten those students ready in seventh, eighth and ninth grade to be thinking about this, but we'll start that now. So whereas the first year 
we'll have uh, less students who have the prerequisites every subsequent year. And by year three, we'll be completely up to speed with getting those students ready. Um, I think in the first few years, there's gonna be a lot of collaboration between the community college and, and the high schools. And we're gonna find a way to get this work done if you've been on uh, South 11th, um, exciting, uh, you know, there's some construction. We've got uh, backhoes and uh, we're doing some groundwork there. The city sent a, a letter the other day that gave us an official address for that facility and we're seeing some good work. So just this Monday, the work started in earnest on the Clinton location. Again, with that goal of getting the groundwork in by October, November, constructing that building sometime in February, March, and using March to August to um, outfit that building and be ready for students in August. Perfect, thank you. So it's not gonna be a Chick-fil-A. Just so everybody knows, the construction is not a Chick-fil-A. No matter what you see on Facebook, it's not gonna be a Chick-fil-A. It's a career technical education center. Okay, so workforce, workforce, workforce. It, it, it kind of haunts me in my sleep as we try to develop this workforce pipeline, but we have a lot of great opportunities and we have a lot of great employers online with us today. So I'm gonna pitch this question to Gary. How do our employers engage the district to ensure that your students are aware of the career opportunities that exist within the four walls of their plants or offices? So uh, there's several opportunities. One I just mentioned, we're still looking for some volunteers on this portrait of a graduate. Uh, we would love to get some more community members involved in that process. Uh, we do have a CTE advisory committee uh, that meets twice a year at Clinton High School. And uh, oh, you froze up there, Gary. All right, why we're waiting for Gary to unfreeze. Technical problems, folks. Pitch the same question to Daryl Hogue. People that are working out there in the plants and they're looking for the future of their workforce, they wanna make sure they can tap into that student body. What do they have to do to engage Riverbend schools and ensure that your students are aware of what they're offering? Daryl, you're muted, sir. We are having technical difficulties today, aren't we? Yes. I think it was the full moon earlier this week. Um, so we have, uh, I, I, I invite folks to a 60 by 25, that's a region-wide um, um, planning effort that brings stakeholders together, industry, education, chambers, um, CRDC types, economic developments. Those are great opportunities to tell us what your needs are. And we've been able to cultivate a uh, good conversation about what the needs are. We also have um, teachers and instructors that reach out to businesses directly. Feel free in any way, shape or form if uh, you would like to, I will often take some days of the week and come on site to plants, talk to employers and visit their locations just so I can learn about what their needs are and I can bring those back to the school. Um, we too have a, um, I call it a workforce collaboration. We, we meet on a quarterly to, I mean, COVID sort of messed that up a little bit. We, we, we were meeting quarterly or three times a year and asking employers to um, you know, tell us about their needs and how we can help them. So I, I would say reach out, the easiest way is to reach out to me directly and we can begin a conversation. Um, we're always looking for business partnerships. The other thing is when schools send out invites to have employers come and talk or be a part of the school, please take advantage of that because that's your opportunity to highlight your business. Perfect, thanks, Daryl. Gary, you're back with us now. You wanna finish your thoughts? Well, I don't know where I dropped off, but I had talked about the Clinton High School CT Advisory Committee. Uh, that is one a definite option. I had talked about being involved in Portrait of a Graduate, which will help shape 
the direction where we're going. And then uh, Brian will probably talk a little bit about this. We're talking about an advisory committee for the regional center. I think that's going to be really critical as we talk about these pathways that are going to be offered in capstone courses. They are the, There's going to be a part of this building that's flexible that as market forces change that we're able to pivot and be able to meet those market needs within the regional center. So uh, this is, this is, those are, I'm giving you three great avenues to really be part of the planning process of what we need to do to meet the needs moving forward. Perfect. Brian, same question to you. How can the companies engage students at Clinton Community College? Yeah, and I'll, I'll start off with what Gary alluded to is, uh, you know, coming up here uh, sometime late October, early November, we'll have the first quarterly meeting of uh, the advisory committee for these career academies. And um, I have several, uh, I have several business owners uh, and, and um, a, a lot of interest from industry on being on that all throughout the two county area. Uh, we're going to be bringing together the superintendents and industry for these rather large meetings, and that's where we get to listen. We're going to do that four times a year for the next 10 years. It's built into our 2080 agreements, and we're going to we're going to be talking about um, emerging needs. We're already having some conversations with employers in the industry or in the area. Lionel Bissell. Um, we've talked to we, we've talked to um, uh, Spiber and a few other folks about some of the, the the different things that might be coming up in the future where we could tailor programs. A lot of times we're taking some of our existing courses and we're creating specialized courses. You know whether it be in in some kind of mold injection or or plastics or some sort of uh, fabrication. We're looking at that, but we need to hear from industry to do that. Gary talked about the flexibility of some of these spaces and we're designing this building, all these buildings to be flexible. So at a time, if we're not getting, um, if we're not getting students uh, in our ag programs or in our automotive programs, and we're gonna ship that to some sort of um, robotics or um, virtual reality or, or something that's coming into the community, we'll be able to switch those spaces and they're designed, they're, they're outfitted with power and these spaces are really flexible. So it's important to us that we're training students for the jobs that are available. Another thing I'd mention is we've tripled our capacity at Clinton Community College in terms of career ready counselors who are moving out to um, the high schools and embedded in the high schools and helping students make the decisions for those next steps. So what's really important to me is to know from industry the opportunities that are there, because not only are these career ready counselors aligning students to these career academies, post graduation options with us to continue their education, but they're also giving students um, ideas about what workforce options are there. A lot of our students are working and going to school with us. So they're doing both right now. They might be working a full-time job at, at Nabisco, or they might be working a full-time job somewhere in the community, but they're also taking courses for us looking for that next step. So it's good for us to know what's available and um, we have a career advisor who works specifically with students who are moving directly into the workforce. Now, when I go out and I visit with companies, I hear about soft skills. I hear about, can they show up on time? I just need somebody to come in and show up on time and make sure they're dependable. What are we doing within the district, specifically K through 12 and also community college? And I'll shift this question to you, Brian, so you can go first, uh, to ensure that, that these young professionals understand the importance of showing up on time, having a rock solid work ethic, because that seems to be what these companies want most, because they're willing to train, they're willing to mold these individuals and help them progress throughout the company, but they're just missing some of the basics. Yeah, and um, I'll I'll uh, I'll try to get a thumbs up from uh, uh, Gary and, and Daryl, but I think that this conversation has been uh, pretty pretty consistent for about 25 years now, if I'm counting it right. <laughs> and um, it it is, you know, I, I think that when we look at our curriculum, you know, even from the from the junior high school level through high school and throughout community college and your university experience building those soft skills into courses is is 
important as it's ever been, you know, just the basics. And we've had the opportunity to tour several, um, several facilities within the last six months. And I haven't gone anywhere where I hear people talk about, where I don't hear people talk about soft skills. Um, you know, what we like to call, you know, emotional intelligence. I mean, just being aware of other people and how your actions impact other people. I think being on a community college campus, you know, we have um, we have some very dedicated faculty here. A lot of my faculty have been here 10 years, 20 years, 25 years, um, really understand the local economy, really understand that skill set that students need and are able to work on them. We have um, some of our concurrent advisors embedded in the high schools uh, teaching speech courses boy I tell you the start to finish of that you know kids that didn't even want to get up and say a word and by the end of that 16 week course are up there and giving these you know amazing presentations with confidence and they're articulate and they're they're energized so we can really be a partner in that I see that need and you know it's something that we've got to start at a very early age and continue on and I would even say um, you know uh, post college that's something we can all continue to work on so that's a professional development piece we can work on even with our staffs so we're modeling that to our students as we as we get them Daryl what's your opinion yeah a couple things one thing just hit me as I was listening to Brian talk is um we offer some soft skills specific training. Uh, the Sock Valley Chamber of Commerce, Chris Noble comes in and meets with our freshmen. It, this is a soft skills program. She brings in local business leaders. They spend six weeks sort of talking about soft skills, doing some soft skills training. So specifically she she targets those. Um, but it, it, it occurred to me as, again, as Brian was talking, we, one of the avenues we probably don't address enough is home life and the things that parents can do. So that's an area I think I'd like to explore more is how do we help parents build grit, tenacity, determination? These are all the things that are gonna make a person successful along with the soft skills that, that mom and dad display and can teach them. Um, I think that's a, a partnership that could really grow in the area of soft skills. Again, we embed those skills into as many classes as we can. We have a, a pre-K to 12 um, career plan that we, we specifically place these skills in specific classes. And um, again, I would want the employers to know that we care deeply about this and everything we do, we are sort of reflecting on how do we develop better communicators, better um, um, you know, um, students who are um, committed to the task and the projects we ask them to do. Gary? I'm gonna build off what uh, Daryl was saying a little bit on the importance of building those skills, particularly in the lower elementary level, where really a lot of those skills are the parents uh, supporting us in that regard. And I mean, we're making a, a significant uh, commitment towards attendance this year at Clinton Community School District. Uh, we've had several, <laughs> um, the, we've had several meetings with the county attorney, Mike Wolf, and how we can work together to try to ensure that kids are, are in school every day and, and trying to find supports for the, for the families that were falling short on that. So, uh, I do think some of those habits and things are formed in the home and uh, we've got to find ways that we can intervene quicker at, to get to that level. Then I, I know I'm going to keep going back to portrait of a graduate, but portrait of a graduate really is kind of like taking those soft skills and now they're actually not going to be a byproduct, but they're actually our driving force. So when we talk about graduating, are we now talking like what most of us uh, think about four, you know, four years of English, three years of math, three, you know, three years of science instead of that's what it takes to graduate. Does it come down to uh, what, what is your attendance rate? What's your ability to communicate? How, how do you collaborate with others? 
what's your follow through on when you have to do independent tasks? Uh, what's your level of innovation and creativity? Uh, what's your ability to problem solve, critically think? Uh, those are the measures which I think are what we're talking about for soft skills that actually now become the primary drivers to graduate rather than a byproduct of probably a, a, a system that is, in my mind, outdated that you need Carnegie units and seat time and you have to pass this many years of a subject in order to graduate. So historically we've heard and, and you know I've heard that there's been always been a strong push in districts uh, at school districts K through 12 even as well as community college for somebody to obtain a four year degree. Now I'm hearing that conversation start to change a little bit. It seems like we're letting people know that there's options out there that's not just uh, a four year degree following graduation from high school. So Gary, what conversations are you having in the hallways or with your counselors as far as identifying those students who may not be interested in pursuing a four year degree? What's that sound like? Uh it, it is a shift. I'm, I'm going to tell you that because it, it is in a K-12 DNA that we we want to promote education and we want to push kids towards a four-year program. But Brian's going to recite here pretty quickly, so I'll beat him to the punch on this, that really 70% of the jobs that are out there require a two-year degree or less beyond high school, like 18 month to two year degree. That's where the majority of jobs, and these are well paid jobs. And I really do think us working with counselors, and like I said, Brian has mentioned now that I think that there's going to be these career counselors that are gonna work with our counselors to say, we need to do a better job in the four year planning. In Iowa, you're required that four year plan between freshmen in senior year of high school in terms of doing that, but really looking at that transition that it's not always a four year college that are we looking at things that are more than a year or two beyond high school? And do we get some uh, that college credit in that junior and senior year of high school? This again, Brian will talk about being able to reduce that student loan uh, debt coming out of college that make will make it appealing for a number of students to think about, well, maybe that that one to two year degree beyond high school meets my passion. And that that's the definition of success, not a four year college. But Andy, again, I, I totally agree how our counselors are are working with our kids at that high school level will be critical. Yeah, Brian. Twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars a year more in a working career with a four-year degree. So if we look at that statistic hasn't changed. That statistic continues to grow. So if we look at a forty-year career, you work twenty-five to sixty-five, and you make twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars a year more during that time. That's about one to one point two five million dollars in your career of extra earning potential. Um, at we have a, a really generous foundation and a really great foundation at Clinton Community College, the Paul B. Scherer Foundation. And um, at the grocery store, uh, getting gas, um, taking the dog for a walk, I'm always talking to people and uh, parents and grandparents and students about how we can get you through a lot of our programs for low or no cost. You know, I'm looking at students right now who are in our engineering technology program, high demand program, lots of opportunities in the community. If you have a last dollar scholarship opportunity, if you have a if you have a Metallica scholarship or you're a Metallica scholar, you could be getting money back. You could be getting money back. You're going to school and we're giving you a little extra to live on with that scenario. I've got several programs where we have those opportunities. Um, uh, it, I understand. I understand the ability to 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 provide options for students. Given my position and my passion, I'm always going to be an advocate for higher education and keeping students on on a path. Realizing that's not for everyone, I think we can find ways to provide additional training beyond high school 
that maybe isn't a degree. And we're doing a lot of that program with contract training directly with our employers. We're doing uh, certificate programs, shorter ter term programs that are latticed and credentialed that lead to uh, you know bigger outcomes. Some people take five years to get through a two-year degree. Some people take eight years to get through um, a bachelor's degree, and that's okay. But what, what can we do to support them along the way? And what can we do to ensure them? Again, I wanna go back to that statistic. You know, Gary, Gary threw out one of my favorites, 70% of, um, of jobs in this community require post high school education. And couple that with what we know at the end of the recession last, last time in 2008, when we lost all those jobs and our economy crashed, Four out of five of those jobs lost, 80% of those jobs lost were for people who had no education beyond high school. What we're trying to do here is build an infrastructure for our community where that doesn't happen and we can lessen the impact. Perfect, thank you. Daryl? Andy, rephrase the question. I've been listening so intently and I think I'm, I know where my answer is going, but rephrase the question for me, would you? The mindset that we, and, and Gary said, it's been ingrained in education for a long time is that you push for a four-year degree. I know you and I have had conversations about this, but what does that conversation look like within the halls of Riverbend School District with your counselors and identifying yeah. those students yeah. who may not be going off to a four-year college? Yeah. So again, we have a, um, a K-12 um, career plan um, that, that um, puts, very specific activities into um, a K-12 experience at Riverbend schools. And so with that in mind, in seventh and eighth grade, we begin career exploration intensely through a uh, software program that continues with the students. It's called Zello in high school. And kids like in Illinois or Iowa um, kind of carve out some plans. Our counselors um, are always and, and our teachers we employ our well we, we you know, employ bring them in on this conversation so that they can encourage kids to look at these opportunities um, we also are trying to create skill sets within our school that will um, help students explore careers I think that's where this begins so that they know what they want to do and they know what they do not want to do um, College, as we, we often say this, college is not the place to begin career exploration. It's the place to begin career enhancement or growth or training. Uh, if we can begin that in high school, and not the saying that you're locked into a career pathway forever, but career pathway explorations and conversations, again, start early on. And then as kids begin to get a little older, we kind of help refine that. And we really do target their strengths and their likes so that they um, find jobs that they like. I love to say this, if you love what you do, you will always love what you do. That's a really simple formula, but it's a very uh, kind of obvious one. And it's very true. If you can find what you really like to do and you get to do that for work, that's going to be real important. And we, we, uh, we encourage certificates and we encourage um, apprenticeships and, and we also, on the same time, encourage um, students to look at the opportunities that exist. And one thing that exists on the Illinois side of the river, I'm, we've talked about this a little bit, is um, SOC Valley Community College has something called the SOC Impact Program, and that provides free tuition, up to three years of free tuition for students who um, work 25 volunteer hours and commit to the program their freshman year of high school. Riverbend High School was um, selected along with Prophetstown High School to be the pilots of this program. 77% of our freshman class are enrolled in the SOC impact program. That doesn't mean they're gonna go after a two-year degree. It means they have the opportunity for a certificate and, um, and or two-year degree if they so choose, or to take that in, into a two-year degree and move on to a four-year program. But 77% of the students are enrolled in this program. So we keep you know, kind of trying to provide those essential skills 
and training um, through our community colleges. Thank you, Daryl. And I would encourage you, if you're watching this program, to go ahead and type in a question in the chat or simply unmute yourself and ask the, the guest today. I did put Gary, Daryl, and Brian's email address in the chat. One of the things we talked about a lot today is employer engage, employers engaging with those in education. And that's what we need to do more collaboratively. And you guys have done a great job in doing so, but it's gonna take, it's a two-way conversation. So employers also need to reach out to those in education and higher education to express what they need um, from a future workforce. So I'm so glad that you guys were kind of hammering that message home. We have a lot of employers on today that can simply shoot you an email and say, we need this, or we're looking for this, or just ask you a question and receive a quick response. So again, if you have any questions, please just unmute yourself and ask. It's that simple. I don't want to always hear myself talk during these presentations. So Gary, what's something you're very excited about moving forward from a workforce development standpoint? You talked about portrait of the graduate. We're excited about that. But what do you see in the future of education as it aligns with workforce development? Well, I think one thing is, is uh, we're currently building a new Clinton High School, and um, I've, I've been under the I've been saying this to everybody and uh, our architect in particular. And as this goes up, I I actually want this to not feel like a high school when it's finished. I want it to feel like a workplace, and that we we get that feel. So some of the things that I, we are looking at is not having clocks in the room, not having the ringing bells not having things that you would traditionally ha have in a school that you would not see in a workplace. Uh, so we're actually trying to build build the building to support work workplace readiness. Um, we talk about the flexibility uh, uh, of this building uh, for the CTE Center. We're trying to do the same thing with our high school that we that we can actually repurpose spaces if we see shifts in what's what where the marketplace is going what kids interests are that we're being responsive to that so uh, uh, we're trying to do it this holistically that it isn't just a concept a portrait of a graduate or or just doing a uh, working with uh, additional pathways through the cte center but we're also just yeah, how, how is this new high school going to support this workplace initiative and the, the future students coming through? Daryl, same question to you. What do you see for the future of education K through 12 moving forward as it relates to workforce development? I think just more partnerships. We I'm excited to, you know, hopefully we can push through COVID uh, again. I'm, everybody knows that next month is manufacturers. Uh, um, October is a kind of a manufacturing highlighting month. We've been challenged to find places. We used to have a, bring kids on site. We did a full day with them um, with some partners, uh, Morrison Institute of Technology, and um, we're not able to do that right now. We're looking for those places to do that. I, I think the partnership piece is going to be key, especially with um, the number of jobs that exist, and this just blows my mind. I mean, everywhere we go and every employer on here probably can tell us how many, I mean, if we were to ask us all, how many employment openings do you have, us included, we have openings, um, where can we get, you know, how do we connect people to those openings? And we wanna be part of that problem solving um, conversation. I believe schools are the pipeline and supplier of people to the employment field and we have to just continue to and it takes a lot of determination and work to keep these conversations going we all have had these conversations we feel like that's all we do is talk but we are making headway we have apprenticeship programs starting we have partnerships with other employers i have an employer who is willing to take students who are struggling and um, put them to work and give them time to get their degree as well. So they're small numbers, but we're making headway. And I hope the employers will stick with us and just remain um, connected to us and help us help them because we are willing and uh, want to do that. Brian? 
Yeah, you know, it's 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 the relationships. I think it's it's the relationships with industry. It's the relationships with our school districts, our superintendents, and um, some of the exciting things. You know, I think of the Governor's Future Ready Iowa program. Um, we have upwards of um, of forty programs that students can enroll in if they file a FAFSA. Um, they will have no cost to attend those programs, programs like graphic arts and health professions and engineering technology. Um, this is, uh, this is a, an amazing opportunity for students to go to and, and get an education and a skill that they can apply to industry right away for, for no cost. Something else I'm really proud of just announced this week, the Iowa Department of Education announced that Iowa's high set graduation rate and high set is the high school equivalency test. So these are these are our community members who maybe fell through the cracks and weren't able to graduate one of our local high schools. Um, what we used to call GED, but now is, is a high set program. 29 states are using this high school equivalency program. Iowa was the highest ranked state in the country with a 96% graduation rate on that test. So 96% of the students who took that test were successful and received their high school equivalency. To give you some context, national average is 80%. So that's another piece. I know many of our employers, um, that's that's the, the ground level. A lot of them won't take employees without high school diploma or high school equivalency. So I think we have to look at not only our students who will go on and earn doctorates going through our education system, we have to look through students who, who struggled in high school, give them an opportunity to go. I want everyone to have an option. And I think things like High Set, our career academies, Future Ready Iowa, we've got a lot of options for our community right now. And part of you know what I want everyone on this call to do, and everyone in the community to do, is really share those opportunities. I think a lot of people feel left out or left behind. Um, other folks struggled. And for the folks that struggle, I don't know if they always see the opportunities that are available to them, but we've got to talk about those opportunities all the time. Well, I want to thank you gentlemen so much for taking the time to speak with a group of our regional employers today. Workforce, workforce, workforce. We continue to have this conversation, but as everybody is hearing, we're taking steps to ensure that we're going to meet that workforce demand of the future. And again, I strongly encourage you to just shoot these gentlemen an email and start that conversation. It's that simple. And when I go out and I meet with companies and they want to talk to me about workforce and soft skills, I take that information. I go back to our superintendents. I go back to, to President Brian Kelly of the Community College, and I share with them what's being said out there. And then they, in turn, develop programming to solve that problem. So again, it's about collaboration. It's about having that conversation. Again, thank you so much for being with us today. We're going to go out and enjoy some beautiful weather. If you got a chance, go take a walk along the riverfront or, or get out there and, and eat lunch along the river. Or in, in uh, Daryl's case, you can go by the windmill over there in Fulton. But uh, have a good weekend. And if you need anything at all, please shoot me an email. Everybody's got my email address. We're here to serve as an extension of your staff. We're here to serve as a conduit. And the CRDC is excited to help with developing solutions to any kind of workforce problems. So that being said, I will see everybody, uh, maybe some of you on Monday, but have a great weekend and we'll talk soon. Thank you so much, Andy. All right, see you everybody.